Hey everyone, Tony here and I have an exciting announcement before our episode begins. Some time ago, Victoria Rogers of the Broadswords podcast set about gathering other podcasters for a promotion of the upcoming book from Wizards of the Coast, Mordekainen's Tome of Foes. We were lucky enough to be a part of this amazing opportunity and are going to be featured with 22 other awesome podcasts for this podcast of foes. We'll be running a one-shot in the world of Ostia, utilizing the material from Tome of Foes, and be featured on the Dungeon Delve podcast feed. Our own episode will be released May 14th, so please come check us out, and thank you so much, Victoria, for including us in this amazing opportunity. I really don't think I can convey how excited I am about this. Again, come check us out May 14th for Podcast of Foes. But for now, on to the show. Have you ever found yourself, after a game of D&D, debating over a particular rule that came up, and trying to figure out, as a group, how to break it? As a DM, do you get that feeling of dread when your player asks, if you look at it this way? Well, we decided to turn that into a podcast. A group of DMs come together every episode as we discuss how rules is written, we can figure out how to maximize what we can do with a rule, and how we can use other rules to break the game. Each episode, we will be joined by a guest, including DMs from some of our favorite podcasts, and get a sneak peek behind the DM screen from some of our favorite shows, as they share their own thoughts and experiences on a particular rule and how it has affected their games. Please feel free to jump in on our discussions by leaving us a comment on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, or feel free to email me at dm at dndraw.com, or send us a tweet to at rulesaswritten, and let us know how the rule may have come up during one of your games, or how you figured out a way to break the game that we didn't discuss. So... Thanks for joining us. Hey, everyone. I'm Tony. Hi, this is Bethany. Hey, this is Rachel. Hi, I'm Mike. And I'm Giuseppe. Hey, everyone. This is Tony from the future. Just wanting to say that we had so much fun discussing the topic this week that we actually split the episode into two separate episodes. So be sure to also check out part two when it comes out in two weeks. Anyway, on with the show. Today, we will be discussing crafting and tool proficiencies. So you guys are creating a podcast that you will be calling Bookworms. What's it going to be about? Yes. We are. The podcast will ideally be about expanding upon and improving the 5th edition engine by going into various different RPGs with all of their story-driven mechanics or really hard and crunchy bits, finding what works, and bringing them back to the game we love. Because between Michael and I, we've read every RPG? Wow, that, that's most a bit ambitious. That most. Most of most, them. A lot. We read RPGs for fun. We never have time to play them, so we just like to put all of them in one game. So let's go ahead and jump right into the topics. This is actually something that, like... It bothers me a lot because in uh, your game, Bethany, I have my my fighter who I was like, well, I get uh, for being a battle master, I get a tool proficiency. I mean, it'd be really cool if I do smithing, like I can build my own armor and do all this stuff. It'll be great, but I never use it. (laughs) That's because you're off adventuring. I think that's been the struggle with like any a lot of these proficiencies is they just don't get used very much because people are only using the ones that they could do on the road, <laughs> in a sense. Now you're going to get me down a rabbit hole about downtime and why it's the most important part of the campaign. I love <laughs> downtime. Oh. Carousing. <laughs> Otherwise, okay. you have an entire 1 to 20 campaign that takes place in, like, less than a year. I mean, Critical Role's yep. entire first season was, like, less than a year of game time. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the way our game, our face-to-face that, game is that's running. That's ridiculous. Like, a, during summer vacation, you can go from being a commoner to a 10th-level uh, fighter. <laughs> Isn't that yeah. like every eighties movie though? That's true. Yeah, in a sense. We just montage. by montage, right? Yeah. yeah. That's I mean, it. essentially in, in the campaign it's been three months and we've gone from one to fifteen. Yep. Okay. My campaign right now, <laughs> I just gave them I just gave them level four, just out of the kindness of my heart. Prodigy. It has been because they wanted feats. How many months <laughs> in game has it been? Four now? Four? I thought it was three. No, I think you guys crossed into month four because you guys stopped in Hammerfest so you could forge 
a bunch of armor. That that was the in story reason. The real reason we were in Hammerfast was a month was because we couldn't get together. No, the uh, forge cleric was going to forge his plate, whether or not you guys were going to wait for him or not. He was staying there to oh. forge that plate. Sidebar: That takes way too long. Like okay. I think by the book. So, no, yeah, no, no, let's no, talk about that because yeah. we have forge yeah. cleric on here. Like, let's talk about that. Oh gosh, yeah, the forge cleric, uh, just the smith's tools and all that. I mean, it takes so long to build anything in D anD. d Like, ugh, well, what? like forge cleric is kind of weird. Where we've got it to the point where I need javelins. You got gold? Y- y- yes. Toss it in the circle, and then like an hour later, I've got javelins, and that works. But then when it's something like I need armor, no, that 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 does take way too long. Yeah, I really love that you chose javelins. By the way, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I'm a fighter that uses strength, and even though I only take a minus one to like a ranged attack with a bow, I might as well just throw things with javelins, and it's really easy. And if he needs like metal quickly, I can just dump all my javelins into a pile, and he can use that as raw materials. If we're gonna talk about forge clerics, then we need to discuss whether or not their channel divinity, the ritual that allows them to construct up to 100 golds worth of material mm-hmm. is allowed to be used incrementally. Oh. Because that is, I have seen that read both ways. There is some real argument about that. I would say you got to do it at once because it says it's completed at the end of the hour as in it's one ritual. Yeah. It's a long ritual. But if you have something that can be made up of pieces and then put together at the end. Can you cobble together plate from half plate like hmm. over 15 uses of channel divinity can you put together the components of plate metal well i guess that kind of that goes back to do rituals have to be all at once in general in D and i believe they do but maybe they that's do. an assumption so this is a ritual so i think it needs to be all in one go yes but see plate is not all one piece true so yeah the, that's where it's like can over 15 channel divinities you get 1500 gold worth of armor if you're, you're making an arm at one point or something like yeah. that, you're just doing it in pieces. Yeah. It does say, like, and another metal object. So if you, yeah, are starting on plate, that I could I could see the rule ruling that, yeah, I mean, you can make the shoulder piece of a plate mail and then the But then it's the like, piece. there's no cost for that. So how do you educate? You're <laughs> almost encouraged then to go, okay, I guess you can do it over 15 Well, then you have sessions. to determine when you break it down. Like... How much of the armor are you allowed to make in one ritual? Well, and you still have to put it all together still, too. Like the, So maybe 16 time. rituals? I don't know. Well, that's what I I'm saying. Well, I think some of it would have to be non-ritual because once it's all, you have all these pieces. Created, yeah. So you well, they are proficient 50. in smith's tools. They that's can true. do that. Mm. Well, and after that, they just need to attach everything. <laughs> I guess it actually wouldn't be too bad because you still are having to use up your channel divinity. That's true. And that still yeah. takes at minimum eight days. Because, yeah. oh, unless your DM is allowing you to take naps all the time. <laughs> but you can only benefit from a long rest once every 24 right. hours. Once. So mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So I'd say, I don't think it's as broken as it could be. If It's really make, forcing you to make a choice to not use that channel divinity. Oh, it's not else. It's not broken at all. The channel divinity yeah. as a whole is incredibly niche. I, yeah. Because there's almost no situation yeah. where it's not easier to just go, I'll go buy the thing. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but when you're in the middle of the dungeon and the fighter throws a bunch of javelins on the ground so that you can make a door, <laughs> that is useful. <laughs> is that a specific thing that has occurred, or you just think Not, it could? Uh, yeah, wait, that no, like actually, a that is a thing. That no, you didn't make a door. You made a bunch of uh, made a series of bars to lock a door to to pin it in place. Yes. So you did lock a door with a bunch of former javelins. I would say overall, usually half of my players want to craft. Something, Mm -hmm. somehow, at some point. And they either don't know what they want to do, or they don't know how long it will take and how valuable it will be. So it's often up to the DM to sort of, like, either fudge the system to create something they can actually do, like a process they can follow, or just be really mean and say, you're going to have to give up adventuring for a while. To Yeah, because yeah. there's never been an appropriate set of rules that allow you to both fulfill your Harvest Moon fantasy of making your own things, right. and also the heroic fantasy of going out and using those things. Yeah, yeah, I think... As a DM, I have kind of fudged it with one of our uh, characters in my game. He plays a sorcerer, and he really, really wants to make potions. <laughs> like, <laughs> he so badly. So he had he went out of his way to 
ask me like what can I buy or do so that I can like have something that I can take with me like on the road so I can do some alchemy here and there so I'm not having to do it like at the base with an alchemy set because there just isn't enough time. Yep. So we've got a system for him where he can take his travel alchemy set, which he purchased for himself at great cost, and sort of tote it around in their bag of holding and whip it out to do some work when they're in the middle of a dungeon and there's some downtime while the people are resting. And I don't know that I made the right choice there, but it's made him very happy as a player. <laughs> well, that means you, in the words of Gygax, you did make the right choice. I guess. Yeah. You know? Well, you also have uh, Chris's character that always wants to sew. Oh, yeah. He, we have a monk who's an aspiring... He was like seamstress? Tailor? Seamster? Yep, he's a tailor. <laughs> he's a tailor. <laughs> he's a, yeah, he he wants to collect the hides of every creature they come across and turn it into leather and then make fabulous outfits for everyone out of those things. Well, I don't want to be a stick in the mud, but that would make him a leather worker? Well, yep. he, so, at some point he also, he's also gathered like silk and stuff and made okay, some, some gowns. Fair. So he's, yes. he's very versatile. He's also he's multi shoes. Multifaceted. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something that is important to him as a player. And I have decided to allow, but I really have let go of all realism. I think that's the struggle with crafting is you can't have any sort of, or at least in my game, I can't have any sort of realistic process for this thing should take this long because it just means nothing will ever get done for them because they don't have enough time. Well, you can't play D&D &D expecting realism. I think, <laughs> and I think that's a constant struggle. People want there to be a certain level of realism and and in my mind it's just verisimilitude. It has to feel real. And yeah. that means that, okay, the D&D &D world is full of magic and fighters that jump clear into the sky and attack way too fast. Yep. We're playing an anime game. <laughs> We've been playing an anime game since, I think, second edition. So let's just lean in on that. Your crafting can happen faster. I have a Forge Domain Cleric in my game. He's working on his fifth artisan tool proficiency because he's mm -hmm. got to get all 11 of the ones that would be valuable to his god so that he can create anything at any given, you know, at, at a moment's notice. That's his goal. Like, his character is entirely driven by... I'm going to craft. He's not a knowledge domain cleric that can just say, I am now proficient in the tool that I need to be proficient <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah, he's got to train yeah, yeah. to I'll, get we'll his We'll go proficient. down that road later. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. crafting is very important to him. It's how he's, you know, finding purpose in his character. He is a of the Forge domain. He worships a god of craft. He's got quests related to crafting, which happen on downtime. Like, that's his thing. So I have to go through all the rules and be like, how can we make this work so that it's not going to slow everything down at the table and get in the way of adventuring? And thankfully, our table leaned into it because they just made him a giant list of things the most recent time <laughs> they got to town and went, we're going to go find stuff to do. Here's all of the money. Make these things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so he, he was spent, happy. Yeah, he was happy. He His god was happy with him. He spent 31 days. The extra day was... Uh, because a player added something at the end. Just crafting. Non-stop. And he paid for extra labor to speed that along. And he made what would have taken easily like a year and a half like to do by the standard D&D &D rules. Yeah, five gold worth per day. Yeah. yeah. And so can we just, real quick, five gold per day for mundane items. Yeah. But you're magically five times more effective for magic items. Yes, that was something yep. I totally wanted to bring up. The conversion is baffling. <laughs> it's just, it's mind-blowing. <laughs> yep. And I, I don't know why that happened. It basically... Well, because I mean, the to... magic item costs are obscene. Yeah, I guess they found it's just not feasible otherwise, but it, from an internal, like, logic standpoint, it, it doesn't make any sense. It why kills would it really me. Hard? To make Michael's javelin is five times slower per unit of achievement than making... A, a decanter of endless water or something. <laughs> or a javelin of lightning. Yeah, so javelin of lightning. <laughs> oh, I want one so bad. Oh, javelin of lightning is a awesome. Of lightning. Like, <laughs> the most recent item that we got was a, like, oh, what was it? It was a tankard of sobriety for the fighter. You're the fighter. Don't oh, yes. But I'm <laughs> for, the fighter. for the fighter. For the guy. fighter. Me. Yes. Me. You got a tankard of sobriety, which the party paid a lot of money for, and... The Forge Domain Cleric went to the Arcanist and sold himself into servitude for several days to get it at an affordable rate. But yes, now you can drink with impunity. Yes. 
<laughs> I'm just saying, crafting is awesome. Sometimes. Crafting is awesome. Crafting can drive a lot of things. Questing for components and stuff is really great, but that by the book, read as written, as it were, the rules as written, do not allow for mm-hmm. that. I know, even even Xanathar's Guide, the newer rule is that they focus on by the week, and it's 50 gold per week of uh, mm-hmm. cost of the item. Yep. And even that's just ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and even that doesn't actually, time. one, that's slow, and two, that's cheating. Because the default unit of measurement in the default setting is for time day. is the 10 day. <laughs> ten day. So yeah. they're still yep. giving us five a day. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Just based off of that, that 50 gold per week thing that I find funny is when they you go into potions creating, whereas oh. healing, regular healing potions cost 50 gold, yet they take one day to make. Yeah, like... 25 gold, right? <laughs> and 25 gold to cost to make it. <laughs> like... It kills me. It yeah. Kills me. Yep. <laughs> supreme healing is four work weeks for some reason. Yeah. Supreme healing takes four work weeks, which should be four hundred or two hundred gold worth of you know an item, and its cost is ten thousand gold. Because it, it, it almost seems yep. like sometimes they don't want you to craft. Like the crafting system is punishing you for crafting. I, having played three point five, Wizards of the Coast does not like the idea of players crafting. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, like it cost you said, XP before. But Rachel yeah. said we all want to yeah. be, we all want a Sims thing, some sort of Just simulator experience yeah. at some point. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the thing that when we go back to town and we're not killing monsters or solving a puzzle or dealing with a mystery, it's like, well, you have downtime, kind of thing. It's like, well, I want to make something because I have this ability that I can make things. And every fighter's but- fantasy is, I have forged this sword myself yep. with <laughs> yep. the blood of my enemies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not every fighter. I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, Tony's you. fighter. No, no. That was one of my favorite things because it took me so long, and I had to essentially sacrifice my sword for a while, but I crafted a silvered sword, which was one of the easiest and cheapest things I could make at the time, and then we went into a fight in which an enemy had resistance to like all uh, non-magical weapons except silver. And you felt amazing, I, I bet. I felt great. I'm like, wow, I can do damage to this but, thing. But Tony, least. you have to say until. Until <laughs> I did not metagame as a black ooze came to attack us. And I'm like, I would just strike at it with my sword. What? Like, and take what the negative of... one to the sword. I don't know, black puddings, man. Yeah. Oh, man. You got inspiration for playing your character. I did, but I was like. <laughs> As a player, I was so upset because I'm like, I know my character is just going to go up and attack this thing, but I know what it is as a player, well, and I'm going to lose – my sword's going to get damaged from this. And then you find yourself in an interesting position where you've invested so much yep. of your character's time and your personal as – a, as a player, your actual energy into making an item, and it feels great and it's awesome, and then you roll up a treasure stash and there's a plus one sword – and you're stuck going, there is literally no reason I would not be using this right now. It is in every way better than this piece of garbage I just crafted. <laughs> yeah. But I care about the one I crafted. But I now I know it's everything. useless. So, like, the game has punished me for having put my heart and soul into something. Into making it. And I feel subpar. And then what am I going to do? Sell the sword? For what? First of all. It's ridiculous that anyone's buying or selling magic items. But yeah. secondly, what are you going to use the money on? Because what are you going to craft something else? No. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I do like what I wound up doing with the sword because my character became engaged to an NPC. And so he, with the damaged sword now, melted it down from the silver and created two rings from it. It was cute and really How many cheesy. work weeks did that take you? <laughs> <laughs> he actually got to- help. So that's something that did come up, because that actually does play into the rules, where you can speed it up if you have help, and he recruited, like, the local blacksmith, like, hey, can you jump in with your three apprentices, and, like, like let's just bang this out in an afternoon. Yeah. So thankfully, with help, it only took, like, a day. Well, that's it good. Did, it didn't even take a day. I'm not evil. I was like, no. <laughs> I think it took but a couple r- hours. But rules as written, though, that would have been... Yeah, even with easily multiple... Been well, because silver days. rings cost how much? Yeah. Probably a hundred gold. I'm just gonna guess. <laughs> I, I decided Gosh. she was a half elf. She probably has very, very, very small ring. <laughs> it shouldn't be too bad. But yeah, it was a nice story moment. I do like that story moments come out of crafting, and I think that's yeah. why we all struggle with it. Because if it wasn't engaging, we just wouldn't care. 
All right, so I'm looking at like the the actual rules from Xanathar's Guide for Crafting, and they have There's this whole section on complications, which oh. I find interesting, but I hate the idea of actually doing it. Wait, wait, wait. Yep. You hate that idea? Because I love that idea. My regret is that it's only a 10% chance. <laughs> <laughs> you want that? I feel like... Well, because... We- our- so, so here's the thing. Like, that... Uh, take the uh, Smith doing yeah. his 30 days of, like, crafting, right? The yeah. rest of us are looking for things to do. Oh, okay. I see what you're so, saying. So it's not for the crafter. It's for the rest of the party. Exactly. No, yeah. no. Like, like uh, number six, the competitor spreads rumors that your work is shoddy and prone to failure. Like, in our group, it would be... The We're going to go find that guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the dwarf is like, I don't care. Like, it's not getting in my way. And I was like, no, no, no. We care for your reputation. <laughs> we'll take care of this. And then you have, like, this little investigation game, and, like, you play that out. You know? So you kind of share the spotlight in that way. Though, to be fair, that means you're leaving the dwarf out of things. Yeah, I think that's maybe why I reacted against it where i thought like either the other party members are taking care of it or you have to stop your work and deal with this one or the other so like it's sort of a division but i guess also in my one of my experience i've had multiple crafters working at the same time like they're like it's downtime everyone whip out whatever your tools are sewing needles you know smith tools and get down to it like it's time and then rachel's like my character's going carousing so no 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 (laughs) i help I help in the market. I tend to my orphans. I find things that are productive. You do. You do. I you don't just don't craft. have a skill. <laughs> you, you don't have any skills, but you're helpful. <laughs> well, when we're when we're actually back in town, I have a plan. Okay, I have a plan because I'm Andy. oath of ancients. I'm gonna have a freaking farm. <laughs> this is happening. This is happening. Farm crafting. Grindo yeah, needs already- wheat, so I'll make wheat. Yeah. Yeah, she already warned me she was going to do this. So as a DM, I have to figure out how farming is going to work. <laughs> yep. As well, part I'm, of- I'm, I'm having to work on cooking rules because Michael's <laughs> fighter decided he was going to become a gourmand. No, it was decided That's- for me that I was apparently Anthony Bourdain. <laughs> it's oh. true. You go to new places, you drink too much, and you talk with the locals. And eat their food. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Have, the, do you have the personality of Anthony Bourdain, though? No, I'm much oh. nicer. Okay, good. Phew. He, was <laughs> he spent most good. of his formative years among the druids, so he's pretty free love. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. okay. Fight the so power. I guess... That actually, like, yeah, there's, with the cook's utensils and everything, that makes sense, your your little comments there. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is also that, that uh, gourmand uh, feat, right? From the yeah. Oh, that's Arcana? Unearthed Arcana, though. Yeah. Yeah. That I don't was know if you've looked at that. Is that uh, what, you were like, I need that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was interesting enough that Rachel, I think you and I talked about it, and you're like, can our NPC, like, take this feat? So he'll be like, we know he's a great cook, but, like, now he'll have, like, special abilities. But yeah. this was, I think, last year it came out? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was It was a while ago. The Gourmand Feat. You have mastered a variety of special recipes, allowing you to prepare exotic dishes with useful effects. You gain the following benefits. You increase your constitution score by one to a maximum of 20. Gain proficiency with cook's utensils, and if you're already proficient with them, double your proficiency bonus. As an action, you can inspect a drink or plate of food within five feet of you and determine whether it's poisoned, provided you can see and smell it. And during a long rest, you can prepare and serve a meal that helps you or your allies recover from the rigors of adventuring. Uh, As long as you have the supplies for it, you can feed up to six people, and everyone gets two additional hit die at the end of their long rest. And anyone who partakes in the meal has advantage on constitution saving throws against disease for the next 24 hours. It's pretty cool. That is like really that. good, but the yeah. only thing is that constitution bump is kind of going to waste. It's on you. Get out of your character mindset. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Just no, no, on that, you. No, that, like, we, we are already dis- discussing this before the podcast. Just that gives you expertise. The double your proficiency if you are yep. proficient. That was something that I was looking for in other tools. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I double checked. Expertise. Okay, expertise is not actually a term; it's just the class feature name. Yes. Yeah. And you have it in Bard, and you have it in Rogue, and you can only get it for thieves' tools with a Rogue. Other than that, there is no way to get expertise in a tool. Yeah, I was trying to look that up too, and I couldn't see anything that gave you expertise in a tool. None. Nine zilch. It's almost like you're not really, despite the lip service, you're not really supposed to use them. The tools? Yeah. Maybe that's why they started giving a bunch of suggestions as to how you can use the tools for other things. Yeah, like, here's how to apply to the things you know to things that we care about. Yep. 
like yeah things crafts. that are actually gonna impact the game and the story like otherwise what's the point of being a cobbler i guess besides to have a trade <laughs> I just find funny how Xanathar's guide kind of contradicts what the Dungeon Master's guide says about using tools with skill checks. Yeah. Tell us, tell us why, Tony. <laughs> well, at the very end, under tools under the DMG, it says, however, the proficiency bonus wouldn't allow a character who's proficient in like wood carving to be able to make in a check to identify unsafe wooden construction or discern the origin of a crafted item. Since neither requires a tool check. Yeah, I think their idea was if you don't have a physical tool you're wielding, then nothing. Which doesn't make any sense. Yeah, which yeah. made it even worse because right. at the core, tool proficiencies are not just, they're knowledge skills before anything else. Right. Yep, the tool is kind of incidental for a lot of these. Yeah. But of course, the funny thing is under Carpenter's tool, it actually says you gain insight in inspecting areas within wooden structures and you can spot irregularities in wooden walls or floors. Ha! Huh. Take that, Mike Merles. <laughs> was that in Xanathar's Guide, or that was that also in? No, that's in Xanathar's Guide, yeah. under Carpenter's Tools, Investigate and Perception for it. Might have been Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, even Find a Weak's Point in a Wooden Wall has a DC is a DC example that they use. DC 15, by the way. Well, because I think you're when you're building a character and you're picking a background or building your own background, you're getting a tools proficiency with it. And I'd have to say, like, for... It's either... You're a character who wants to craft, or a player who wants to craft, and you pick something for that, or it's just a throwaway. Like, it's just whatever came with your soldier, so you well, have a gaming set. Can we be realistic here? By, as written, before Xanathar's Guide, especially, mm -hmm. your proficiencies line for tools read Thieves' Tools, or it doesn't matter. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> because, and that, which is a really weird dynamic, because there's one tool... That is always really, really good to have proficiency in. There's one or two tools that maybe might come up looking at you like healer's kit or disguise kit. Yeah, disguise kit. Herbalism kit. Herbalism. Is... But yeah, probably disguise kit, I think is the one, Rachel, you're saying. That's one of the only like three or four that have been used in our game. Yeah, there's there's a small handful. Maybe if you have alchemy or alchemist kit proficiency, the GM might be like, oh, you can, you know, totally identify the poison that killed this guy. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> The rest were so it's like, why would you ever pick these? There's no reason. Which is so sad. Yeah, because there's some like skills I don't have a soft spot for. Cartographer's tools. Like, I think they're awesome. I like the idea of making maps and we've actually had several players who are invested in map making. Yeah, we've always we've had a, <laughs> at least one player in every game who's been really interested in like as uh, as like their character is drawing a map of the area. But I think before that, no one would pick cartographer's tools because it just doesn't sound it's super useless. useless. <laughs> well, there's another proficiency that is near and dear to my heart, which is uh, the forgery kit. Because uh -huh. uh. paperwork makes it not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> if, no, like legitimately an older... It's a really good way to put that. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. No, because in older editions, you know how you saw through forgeries? Mm -hmm. uh, you used linguistics, and the only way you could get past it was to use linguistics, and no one got training in that. So if you were a rogue, <laughs> you just put points into the, your forgery thing, and you could get in anywhere. Yep. Between your disguise and your bluff and everything else. And a forgery kit is much the same, which uh, I made notes on this earlier, but um, you cannot actually use a forgery kit to, to determine forgeries. No, yes. you can't. That is actually a calligraphy kit thing. Yeah, that Which is, is so strange. hilarious. And I guess... I think it's the same thing with a painter's if you forge like a painting or something but like you that. You can't too. use the painter's kit to forge paintings. Yeah. You can't use it to forge paintings, but you can determine if a painting's a forgery with a painter's kit. Yes. So there, so there are a couple of really weird... But like, still, I love the forger's kit. It's almost like you're supposed to have multiple complementary tool proficiencies but the game makes that nearly impossible to do. <laughs> You'd have to train or get the skilled feet. Oh, I want to take 250 days to train in a tool proficiency. <laughs> can I, like, uh, get a correspondence course? Like, in can, can I get a book and, like, a DIY, like, forgery kit for dummies and just do it on the road? Okay, well, how many hours per day can you put towards that? That, that brings up something Tony did as a DM, the uh, getting a for dummies book, because he let me do that for my character in his game. I did. Um, you wanted to become proficient with an herbalism kit. Because I was a ranger. So you went into, you were in uh, uh, the Duragard town, which for some reason they're like basically really friendly and out of the abyss. Yeah. Um, okay. 
<laughs> Why I, not? I, I, we did I favors for it. them, to be fair. You, you did. Like, There's like six different NPCs in this, this city where you can do favors for them, and then they give you stuff. Um, and they all go up to the party and ask them to do favors for them because they're the party. Yeah. Uh, it's it's like when you go into uh, Phandalin in the uh, Lost Mine of Phandelver, and it's mm. just, look at all the exclamation points on your map. Yep. <laughs> all of these NPCs want to talk to you. Yes. Yeah, it was yep, pretty much like ex- that. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much exactly what it was. Turns yeah. out, if you don't actually have the NPCs go talk to the party, they will ignore all of them, though. I learned that the hard way. Oh, no. Ooh. Well, no, we chased out every lead in this game. Yeah. We were those kind of every, players. Every chance every chance they got, they were like, oh, well, I want to look for a shop that has this, and I want to look for a shop that has this. And one of them was like a general store that had a bunch of different books, and you found a book on plants and herbalism. And I, because you already had an herbalism kit, so I'm like, well, if you take time and study this, eventually I'll give you proficiency in herbalism. It was in game over the course of like months of spending my four hours when everyone else was sleeping because I was an elf, you know, studying every night that Tony allowed it to happen. But to be fair, you did say, Tony, that it was under dark herbalism because it was an under dark herbalism book. <laughs> it also, yeah, like the you would gain proficiency in herbalism dealing with anything, any sort of plant life in the underdark because the entire campaign was in the underdark. Well, I was going to say one of the things that the herbalism kit allows you to do, according to the rules, is make a healing potion. Yeah, like, what, but, but alchemy. <laughs> I know, but they even specifically say, like, yeah, you can make healing potions if you, only if you're proficient with an herbalism kit. And that's what I, that's the main reason you wanted to become proficient with herbalism originally was just because you're like, well, I think we're going to need some healing potions. <laughs> so let me see if I can make them. Well, and you did make me go and, like, find plants and stuff like that and do checks for it with the herbalism yeah. once I had the... You're right. Um, I'm looking at the alchemical <laughs> crafting. Yeah. <laughs> Create a puff of smoke, a, identify a poison, identify a substance, start a fire, yeah. or neutralize acid. But you can't create a healing potion. Oh my goodness. Which is, I feel like what happened is, in the original rules, they had all of these tool proficiencies, and a lot of them just overlap and don't make any sense, but they like stuck with it. Like, honestly, why is calligrapher supplies a thing? Because that's really just most of the stuff we want to have is going to be in Forger's kit and or cartographers. Like, it's sort of just like a niche part of those other skills. It's because samurai wouldn't make sense to have a forgery (laughs) kit. (laughs) Samurai needs to have calligraphy or painting. Did you not read the Wikipedia article? No, but I think they should be painting, right? (laughs) Well, you get your choice between the two. I want to, I I, I think what happened, and I want to defend 5th edition a little bit on this. You can. Because the source of a lot of these sorts of oversights and issues with 5th edition come from two things. First of all, a fear of backlash if they start doing like they did with 4th edition and having like monthly erratas, going back and fixing errors and releasing a document, and all of a sudden the books you paid for are no longer correct. They're out of date. Uh, yep. And that annoyed people. Uh, yeah, I didn't mind fair. because I paid for the digital tools, but I can understand um, that it was annoying. And two, the way 5th edition was put together, uh, there were like six different versions of it around at one point, And then they have, they clodged them all together into something. Yeah. And it shows sometimes. <laughs> it does. And this is one of the places it shows. This and the stealth rules, <laughs> which are conspicuously oh, absent, are great examples of how like things got lost in translation. Um, also, the fact that every class doesn't have a reaction. Because... There were several versions where reactions didn't exist. So, like, weird things happen. And I, th- I really do think that, the, to use the second edition parlance, non-weapon proficiencies <laughs> suffered a lot in that process. Because there's so many different ways to handle skills and tools and crafting and, and all these various things that, of course, they couldn't decide on one. Yeah, so I think that's why you kind of get, here's guidelines make yeah, what like, you will it's like the pirates yeah. code <laughs> <laughs> more guidelines than rules i mean pretty much that's that, yeah. that's been my takeaway at, i am glad they put more in xanathar's guide because before yes I, I mean i was there were some things where i'm like i really hope no one ever takes proficiency in this thing because i literally don't know what know to what do, with do with it i'll it. just be making stuff up 
which is fine. I mean, as a DM, that's a big part of what we do. I was going to say, isn't that your job? Yeah, yes. but the less I have to, the better, so I can make up stuff on the big, the big things, and the small things just make sense with the rules, ideally. But... No, 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 no. You make up all of the huge things that no one cares about, and then you get stuck when they ask about small things. That's Honestly, DMing. that's totally what happens. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, and I think one of those has been like those crazy gaming sets that everyone with that soldier oh, background gets, because uh, it pops up all the time. Cause... I have like six different sets of dice. <laughs> and I have equipment that is specially made for the sole purposes of giving me improved gambling checks. There's one thing that does concern me about that. Like, my fighter doesn't have proficiency in sleight of hand. Like, there's no way that he can catch on that someone's cheating. You can't even use perception on that. It's just, you you either know that people are cheating because you too know how to cheat. Yes. <laughs> and but, that's it. <laughs> but Gaspar is a right and honorable man. And he's a fine gambler. Aww. You'll be fine. He That's... won't be fine. <laughs> no. Not at all. I was say, are, are you proficient with insight? Uh, no. <laughs> That's a okay. hard no. My, in character, gonna... he is willful. He, he wants to see the best in people. And I represent oh, that mind. by not will... getting any sort of thing. In no, you want to see the best of the common man. Yes. You will never you... notice someone's cheating then. Never mind. Well, never. To be fair, you could still play a good game and not cheat. Yeah, because if... you're... you're... You're going to roll stupid high, and you're going to be <laughs> yeah. beating people who are cheating, and you're exactly. going to be blissfully unaware. <laughs> you, could have, you could win the right way. <laughs> okay. Like, yeah, I, I got a uh, 32. Yeah, oh so my gosh. On this, guy is sitting, this guy is sitting here loaded with aces in his sleeves, <laughs> and he's just looking at you like, how? How, how, how did yeah. you? How are you and he put his cards down first. I have to, like, uncheat my hand, or I'm going to get shivved. <laughs> <laughs> I guess That's that how is another go. backup plan. Like, are you really going to cheat on the guy that has three auto attacks and action surge that doesn't strike me as a winning combination yeah i imagine the fighter gambling would always gamble with his shirt sleeves rolled all the way up <laughs> <laughs> sit hunched forward casually flexing time to show you what happens if you cheat against me <laughs> or if my party members realize that you're cheating and tell me because i won't know yeah. How, yep. how would the help action work? Like, do you need to have proficiency in gambling tools to you help? Actually, I don't believe it. you can roll the help action for anything. Basically. Anything yeah. at all. So if for the rules, if, pretty much, yeah. We looked this up because we were curious about it. Um, but you don't need proficiency to use any tool at all. What you just don't you gain don't need to be bonus. proficient in it. You don't you, just don't gain the bonus. That's you just it. Pick it up and use the herbalism kit to the best of your yep. abilities. Yep. It won't go well, necessarily, but you theoretically can use it. I've made a healing potion. <laughs> so the reward for having proficiency is either the advantage or the additional effect? So what it actually says under tools is, um, since proficiency with a tool represents broader knowledge of its use, that's it. How Anyone can pick up a hammer. Yeah. That doesn't mean they're good at construction. Yes. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. You can wield it, but you, you can probably don't it. know what to do with it. I can... I can go into a chemistry lab. I can play with the vials and the pretty liquids. Yep. I and shouldn't. You <laughs> might <laughs> discover a way to make a healing potion using the pretty liquids. But... So that kind of brings up something, though. If you have a player character who's using a tool that they are not proficient in, and they're trying to do something that they should not be able to do... Do you still let them roll on the off chance they roll really well and somehow, like, by a fluke, figure it out? Or do you just like, no, man, it's not happening? Like, oh, always. <laughs> yes. Always have them roll. Always let them roll. But I am not entirely certain any of my players would because they know me. Uh, <laughs> you do. What? When the cleric sent the fighter to go investigate, you allowed for me to roll investigate while I was carousing. Oh gosh! Yes, <laughs> knowing f uh, and you did it knowing full well that I would uh -oh. suck up three days of your time. But the oh. thing is, under Brewer's uh, Brewer Supplies, you can roll persuasion for exactly what I was trying to do. But I don't have proficiency in Brewer's tools. I I I do not homebrew. <laughs> I am just a person who appreciates I'm just alcohol. a connoisseur. Of <laughs> You're like I'm not trained in it, but I appreciate. And, good yeah, I like exactly. suds. No, so. So there's that kind of thing where you can try to do it. You should always allow the role and the option rather than just no selling mm -hmm. your player. That mm -hmm. seems better. I just meant that for dangerous things, I don't think any of you would risk it because, you know, I would go, well, you knew the risk going in. So um, 
roll to yeah. save versus that thing blowing up and you being blinded. Well, I mean, oh. I don't know if there's anything quite that dangerous in the tools kit. Like, Poisoner's Kit? Okay. I yeah. get Smith's that. Tools? Smith's Tools? Smith's Tools could You can burn yourself pretty badly pretty, trying to crash. You can something. Johnny Tremaine yourself. Yeah, but I mean, how how badly is a disguise uh, hold kit going to go? Glass blowers tools? Like, yeah. that's got to be the most dangerous oh, no. one. Like, <laughs> oh, 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 epic amounts of fire to heat things uh, could go very bad. Maybe yes. any of the alchemist stuff. Okay. Herbalism just... kit misidentify <laughs> some foxglove. Uh, and then land vehicles. I mean, come on. <laughs> oh I think yeah. The calligraphy one's the worst though. Yeah, so no. dangerous. You could uh, stab yourself with a pen. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with uh with vehicles for yeah. Uh, yeah. when you try to drift that cart. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe it was because I was kind of honing in on brewer supplies, the disguise kit, and the forgery kit. Yeah, you picked the ones where failure is not so bad. The stakes are right. Low. The forgery right. kit, like if you're not proficient and you want to roll that, great. <laughs> I'm gonna roll that. With, you I'm gonna roll that behind the screen though, and you're gonna think it's perfect. <laughs> and so you walk and you're gonna to find out with everyone else. Like it's all in That's, crayon. Yeah. Just like let me yeah. in. Yeah. You will you find out with your left hand <laughs> when their insight check hits the table. Yep. <laughs> Look at my Mona Lisa. It's, it's beautiful. beautiful. It's that painting yeah. of Jesus. So, Tony, <laughs> Tony was trying to provoke me earlier into ranting about land vehicles and land vehicle proficiency. Because no one can drive a cart. That's just me. I'm the only one. But I'm also a Goliath. So they have to, like, he can't just, like, fit the whole party in a cart with him because then the cart's trying to, like, cart. I think we figured out how many pounds. It was, it's a lot. They're a heavy party. It's a lot. No no offense to the player characters. All right, so vehicle proficiencies. Yeah, I rant about this, not because vehicle proficiency is bad, but because I feel like a lot of uh, player characters want to have like a no-risk travel option while having everything they want and also want to drive their own cart. So that's And I'm the only one out. that can drive. I mean... What de- what what defines a no risk travel option? Like they, they just want to have like they want to Uber to their next location. Yep. Like <laughs> basically, we we want to select the fast travel option that yeah, lets yeah. us be there. We just we're there. That's that's it. The end. <laughs> I mean, because unless you're doing regular like planned encounters where like. No one wants to have to do just a random drawn map and like throw a bunch of markers where like yeah some bandits attack you and deal yeah, with that. Yeah, I hate Killed those. We did I hate that. Those. Yeah, that early on that was built into the game, and I was like, "These is this stupid." I it, like it, it doesn't it? have any impact on the plot. Yeah. Kind of drags things down. <laughs> but I think that you keep the vehicle proficiencies in your back pocket for when it is relevant. Like, yep. if you're in town and you need, like, an escape, like you have someone pull a cart outside the window of a tower, everyone jumps in, you need to outrun the city guard, then you start making your vehicle proficiency rules. Well, and we had an opposite thing where they were trying to stop a vehicle where there was a runaway cart. The horses were just, like, running through the city amok and it they were trying to stop It came in them. handy. Yeah, that was the only other time it's really come up in my game where... Tony's character was like, I can stop these horses. I just So I get ran to them. in front, me being the Goliath fighter barbarian, and I knew like where all the horses were connected and just like grab. No, and that's perfect. And that's a good example of using it. But like I don't think people should have to make a vehicle like land proficiency roll to get from city A to city B. Well, yeah, that's what it wound up being though with, overall when we were just like, hey, we're literally just traveling down the road. No, I think it was more like, that was my take. I'm like, you could just get there. And, do, and the party was like, no, we want to make sure we're doing this right. <laughs> you were certain that there was going to be a reason that you, you asked so us fair. why we were, who was in what cart. Oh. Because you you asked us, yes, that's right. Who's going it, in it what just, cart. And then we mattered, like, like when analyzed. You, right when you arrived to the city, who was going to talk to the guards first? Like that was but, all that mattered. But we didn't <laughs> know that. Instead it became like an epic, like half hour long conversation on carts and loads and i was like oh my gosh what have i done you asked us a question that was i know harmless. i know that's the problem <laughs> the dm asked the question it must be important it's the conservation yeah. of detail that comes up with dming if you mention something it's because it's going to be important well and it was important in like just the very end of the journey but then they were paranoid about the journey and i was like it, it's that, yeah it's that's matter. the thing let, and that's good go. that's good to have fun with your players on but 
I mean, if if you don't want them to waste two sessions worrying about what order they're going to be entering the city in. Yeah. Yeah. No, I learned I learned my lesson. I was like, never again. No more carts. No more carts and like discussions. <laughs> the entire last session, basically, I only got to do just them getting the wolves, basically, because I thought the entire party's family together. They're going to leave town like they've been talking about for three sessions. <laughs> it's going to be super exciting. Mm-hmm. Everyone gets together. Well, you know, I still got some stuff to do in town. Yeah, you know, I think I'm going to I'm gonna follow up on that one random thing that I rolled during the carousing roll. Well, I'm going to go do that. No, no, guys, no, I had a plan. <laughs> <laughs> I had a plan. I have things I work. I don't know any of those things. It was the end of the last session. We wanted to kill 20 minutes before everyone scattered. So I had you roll a fun carouse check. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I've done that too, where things have got a little off the rails and not at all what I planned, just because, why not? I mean, you gotta prioritize, and sometimes you just gotta do the random stuff. Yeah. It's the complications yeah. thing. It, it's the argument for just, eh, we have some time to kill, why not randomly spawn a plot line, and then it takes the next five sessions. Uh, here's a question. So musical instruments, you can compose a tune. Like, that is a thing that you mm-hmm. can do, you can just, like, write down a awesome song to use at some later point which sidebar i think is a really neat idea that like you can write down songs and then later hear them in the wild you no, just (laughs) use them as like i can do this thing for you or i could give you this really like change a couple of names and give you this sweet song that i wrote in honor i was a young warthog yeah for (laughs) you you say to your new your newfound patron exactly yes. i've no, written no. this in your honor like that sort of why thing. is it dusty <laughs> yeah. or no no no. i've just been working on it for a long time i just hadn't met you yet or like we need we need to spread a rumor <laughs> i knew i loved you like, before i met you <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> but like you need you need to spread a rumor and you're like oh the part's like yeah no i have it, uh, this song in my back pocket like dm can we use this to gain advantage on our spread of rumor roll you know yeah, no, I think that'd be good. Yeah. got a really good, you know, tavern tune. Correctly. <laughs> Tinker Tools allows for you to repair any damaged object, so long... <laughs> yes, that's right. Any... Tinker yep. Tool proficiency. You're Tony Stark, you can do anything. Uh, improvise <laughs> yeah. a temporary item using a box of scraps is, in fact, on the DC chart. Um, wow, yep. it totally tough. is. <laughs> um, yep. I just saw someone highlight it, yeah. Uh, awesome. Yep. <laughs> but, so it lets you it lets you repair any damaged item... As long as you have some sort of raw materials, which makes me think that the Pots and Pans Paladin is my new favorite concept. Also, the Bargain Bin Bard. Um, <laughs> just the, the most ramshackle equipment possible and just, like, cobbled together from little bits of metal to just keep that AC high. Wait, you're saying every goblin is trained in yeah, Tinker's Tools because they're, like... Because yeah. rock gnomes are. Well, I'm like, just saying, yeah. like the, the rock gnomes are, yeah. The scariest goblin is the one who figured out you can put a dish pot on your, his head. He's got armor now. He's the chief. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's so the one with tinker proficiency. So, in a sense, you basically got your your WD forty and your duct tape, and you could just kind of roll with that and put anything together. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's just that that that's tinker tools, and just that proficiency so, pushed it over the edge in terms of we're not going to be simulationist if you're going to be able to. Pull this off. You're MacGyver. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. There you I go. was trying to remember the name. You're MacGyver. Yep. Temporary yeah. repair disabled device. DC 10. MacGyver was nothing. <laughs> Ma- yeah, yeah, yeah. No. It's, if For one one tool proficiency gives you every knowledge skill. Well, let's go ahead and jump into the interview portion of this. How did you guys get into tabletop RPGs? Uh, that would be me. Uh, I started playing in college. Uh, one of my college roommates had a friend that wanted to DM. I had never played, so just started there. My first character was a gnome sorcerer who used <laughs> shocking grasp to greet people. This was three point five. <laughs> is this is this a buzzer basically? Yeah, it was just a joy buzzer because I always rolled minimum damage and it was useless. Um, <laughs> but eventually, uh. I managed to get my other friends into it, and I kind of fell into the seat of being the always DM. Well, that was around the time 4th edition came out, and I think you invited me over one night, uh, because I had only played sort of like off-brand RPGs, and you're like, play D&D, and I'm like, great! And you had to explain to me why, like, making a sword mage, which was an intelligence-based class with uh, 
nine intelligence was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that. But eventually we got the hang of it, and uh, Giuseppe actually got better at like determining mechanics than I did, while I focused more on the big, broad, like adapting on my feet type of DMing, which I think most DMs ascribe to. Just yeah, the improv classes help you. I'm not that much of a people person. I can't read the table. Yeah. <laughs> but we've been doing that for almost, what, 10, ten years? years now? Yeah. Oh, well, you guys said it oh. together. That was so cute. We're, we're adorable. <laughs> we uh, you really are. <laughs> Clearly. We're sharing headphones right now. Yeah, we got headphones, one in each like... ear. Yeah, we'd like to see a picture of your setup. <laughs> no, I'm going to get a selfie for this for Twitter later. Yeah. Oh, I swear. Please, please Excellent. No, you as can. you should. As you should. This is hard enough as it is. Hashtag <laughs> bro goals. Bros? <laughs> what? Bros? <laughs> You gotta pay the bro toll. Gotta well. pay the bro toll. There we go. All right, then. This is happening. <laughs> took no a weird turn. Right, Rachel. <laughs> Remember how we said, you know, just stop us when we start getting into the weeds? That's always going to happen. So Good to know. I mean, you guys are starting up a podcast now. What got you wanting to do that? Uh, that would be... I'm trying to put the blame squarely. Oh, that would be you guys. That was your fault oh, entirely. No. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it was one of the first three people in that random Twitter thread that started collecting all of the regional creators for D&D content. And then, obviously, Bethany jumped in and organized the entire thing. We all met up. And it was you guys listening to Michael and I going back and forth, yelling at each other and everyone else at the table about their things. <laughs> Um, and asking, hey, so why aren't you doing anything? Yeah, for now. <laughs> once you put that in Michael's head, well... Yeah, I mean, who wouldn't want to listen to me talk? <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what we said. Who wouldn't want to listen to Michael talk? Yeah. Or, or like this. This should be a thing. He's this got those great. velvety <laughs> tones. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we'll take the blame. I think. Yeah, that's that's I'm, it's I'm a straightforward gonna... answer. It's it's your fault. It's we your are fault. okay with this. Well, I mean, considering the fact that you guys are focusing on like all these different RPG systems and incorporating them into Five E, what would you say is your favorite system to play? You know, that's a really straightforward answer because it's fate. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to have a soft spot for D anD D and. It does have a certain, uh, I don't want to say je ne sais quoi because I'm not pretentious of French. Um, it has mechanical crunch that we don't have in other, like in Fate, because Fate's really like loosey goosey. Yeah, yeah. Basically, we're playing D&D right now because I sat the group down and said, Michael needs a break from DMing. Um, we're going to play a game of D&D without Cthulhu Mythos. And with avoiding dragons, we've just done a lot of that previously in our life. And so we started getting into fifth edition and I'm like, I missed D and D. I love D and D, but I need more of the other games I love in my D and D. And the first one was, it was fate because the lucky feat exists in fifth edition and inspiration exists. And both of those are like the poor man's fate points. Um, <laughs> then we also took the virtues and vices from 7th C to help kind of guide characters that way and you know, give nice little non-mechanical benefits. So re really, to get to the actual question, I, I do have a huge soft spot for 5th edition D&D. Just going through the next playtest and just being involved in it. I mean, 4th edition of D&D was my real hard entry into the hobby. So D&D has a real soft spot for me. Um, so just on just on that basis, D and D is probably tied with fate. But otherwise, it, it's also fate. It's, I'm gonna I'm gonna put fifty fifty. Michael, Th this is really hard for me because I, like you said, I do just read a bunch of systems. Oh man, I didn't even mention Ars Magica, and I know I talked for about an yeah, hour. Yeah, Ars Magica, about Ars like Magica. a lot of oh, the God. old style White Wolf stuff, like Changeling and Mage and Geist. You and, and Geist. Geist, like. Ah, this is hard. Um, it, we're not asking you to actually marry one of them. Like, you can date as many <laughs> Like, a long-term committed relationship, relationship would yeah. probably be fate, then. 
Okay. <laughs> really? So we're both we're both going to say fate, and we're doing. A Do you D&D want me podcast. to be contradictory and say no. like something powered by the apocalypse? Because no. fronts are really good. Oh man! Wow. Well, you that, forgot yeah, about that. You forgot about apocalypse. <laughs> I love gaming. I just love gaming. Yeah. <laughs> the point is, we're doing the fifth edition thing right now. And I do love 5th edition. I do. I'm okay with 5th edition. Like, there are a couple of things that I'm eh about, but it's all right. Michael, stop trying to segue into the next section before they finish the interview questions. (laughs) Oh, darn. No, no, it's okay. There's just one final question, but please go ahead. Keep going. (laughs) No, I think it's okay. Like, we all know 5th edition has its flaws. I'd say the reason that I have so much attachment to it is it's a really good recruiting tool oh it is like okay, that's that's that. my favorite part about 5e is i can get people in the door with 5e and i could not with other systems and it's got that logo oh man the new logo is right? so good oh it's it's fantastic Absolutely. yeah yeah it's a, it's a great way to say look how fun this is and it's not that hard <laughs> you, you drop that ampersand on anything and i want to buy it <laughs> <laughs> Now we're gonna tell like it's a cult, but a little bit <laughs> might be yeah. a little bit. A little I bit. I mean, I mean, it's Just it's come. that and the apple apple, right? Like the the yeah. apple apple sounds really dumb, but yeah. I mean that's what it is. What the we're, apple logo? The, oh, yeah. Okay. We're human beings. We respond to iconography. Yeah. Like that's just how we're wired. With all this time playing, what uh, this will be a little difficult, but what would you say is your favorite memory or moment uh, that you've been most proud as either a DM or a player? Okay, Michael. Before you. Start. Keep it to like a minute. <laughs> but which one? Because you're a story. <laughs> well, I like telling stories though. Like, okay, do we do the gala or do we do Kursk coming back? <laughs> no, you don't do the one that requires an entire campaign's worth of backstory. Mm-hmm. So the gala. I guess, if that's your thing. From that campaign, I would have actually gone with the uh, seven holding everyone down because that was hilarious. But the <laughs> Okay, goal. tell us that one. Okay, Go for all it. right. Yes. So we're playing in a Dresden campaign. It's urban fantasy. They're playing like the sort of uh, la- the laundry where they work for a secret organization that tries to keep the supernatural controlled properly. Um, and a couple of the PCs are affiliated with them, and they're following up on this lead for what are. Uh, unofficially on the internet called superheroes so like there's um a fire-based hero like the human torch that's going around burning things uh there's a hulk hogan styled uh like incredible hulk type villain going around and then there's just this guy called seven that's going around and no one really knows much about him except that he's like this desk death stroke type guy they wind up going into uh the government headquarters getting the information they need and as they're leaving one of the investigators uh, is a uh he's a gun wizard effectively he uses magic to help him shoot his gun properly i believe he he is uh his high concept is math magician because he just uses his magic to do uh trick shots trick shots and ricochets oh gosh yeah, the, this, is only, this is only the beginning. You I'm don't so understand. <laughs> For the rest of our party, we also have the Vietnam sniper werewolf. An um, old man. Old, old man. We have a changeling, just a shapeshifter in classic D&D format in modern day. And we have an overworked pencil pusher who works for the organization that the rest of the group is affiliated with. I believe Stennett preferred desk jockey. He oh. was just... Yeah, this is Giuseppe's I was, character. I was playing a pure mortal in a uh, <laughs> in a high-powered Dresden Files RPG game full of just all the all of the powers. <laughs> just uh, the werewolves, shapeshifters, a full-on wizard at one point. I was just a dude. I did paperwork. All of these people walk out of this building at the same time. The gun wizard has a split second to look to the right where there's a highway overpass about maybe, what, 500 yards away? Sounds Let's, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, before a sniper round, like, slams into his side. Like, there was an ambush. He had a split second to try and make a per- uh, perception ch- check and uh, failed. So he just said that he just got hit in the side. Um, so he takes cover, uh, the desk jockey runs back in the building to start getting security in because he's not going out into the firefight. 
the werewolf and the shape changer also take cover while the sniper tries to start counter sniping and the changeling starts trying to like shape shift between the shadows to try and figure out where the guy is. Um, he was just trying to be different people every time he was seen that way. He wasn't like a consistent target. I don't know. Uh, so okay. as it turns out, uh, the guy had prepared enough aspects to just tilt the battlefield in his favor. They would advance and he would use an aspect that he had prepared to trip boost wires. Yeah, trip wires, mines, grenades, e everything to just force the PCs to try different forms of advancement against him. Until the werewolf got really tired of the entire thing, threw his sniper rifle aside, shape changed into a giant, like, Humvee-sized werewolf. Of course. Uh, yeah. The shape changer jumped onto his back with a handgun and just provided covering fire as they charged through, <laughs> took a lot of hits, and just wound up tackling the guy. <laughs> like, the, the werewolf arrived just before, like, his shape change wore off from all the damage he took. Ooh. And... They neutralize him until it turns out that it was just a copy of the guy. <gasps> um, it, it, as it turns out, Seven's name was for uh, the seven different, like, he, he could just split himself into multiple people. So, into seven copies. So we got, we were treated with the image of him leaning out a window from a car driving away at full speed. While we thought we had him, <laughs> and all of that wow. because it, it was just a guy with one hit point, but a lot of preparation. Wow! So, wow! Yeah, that's crazy. They got him eventually, but I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, I mean you have to, yeah. right? Otherwise, what's the point? But yeah, I think your story's probably better than mine. Yes, because it's tell, a competition. I was just yeah. going to tell the story of Keshka and how she pissed off your character so much you jumped off a. Uh, <laughs> hundred story building to follow her and fight her midair into traffic yeah into traffic because there were flying oh. cars yeah it was a good time though that could be seven's honest good. content though. seven's good <laughs> we, stick <to> seven. <laughs> we definitely played on stories for days we there was a point where we thought can we just have a podcast where people tell their D D stories because oh, that's could. literally all of us ever want to do yes you could definitely yeah. do an interview series yeah you know, i was like oh my gosh this fit really in life <laughs> yeah yeah so, this is just the end of the first part of our discussion on crafting and tool proficiencies. Check back in two weeks to listen on part two, and make sure to check out on Podbean, the Bookworms podcast. And that's Bookworms, B-O-O-K-W-Y-R-M-S. In the meantime, though, here's the trailer for the Bookworms podcast. Hey there, everybody. My name is Giuseppe. And I'm Mike. And we're here to tell you about our new show launching in May. The Bookworms, Bookworms Podcast. Podcast. We're two longtime game masters, and we've been taking turns running D&D 5th Edition. It's a blast, but no game is perfect. Each time we start up a game, we end up reaching into other systems to put together the exact experience we're looking for. This podcast is about helping you do the same thing. Each week, we'll do the legwork and talk about how different systems do their thing. We've got a veritable horde of RPGs between us to draw from, and each episode we'll be looking to grant you inspiration from some of the best minds in gaming. We don't just stop at mechanics, though. We'll also talk about different genres and how you can fit them into your game. And if you've been looking for some new magic items to shake up your plot or award your players, you can join us as we explore treasure troves from a wide variety of media. We'll also give you characters you can use on either side of the table. Sometimes it'll tie into the topic of the week, other times, it'll tie into a cool book we read. Here's a brief list of things that we think can be immediately improved with a bi-weekly dose of bookworms. Chases. Political intrigue. Investigations. City management. Gardening. Illegal pit fighting. Heists. Time travel. Gambling. Wizard poker. Pottery. And, and so, so much, much more. more. You can subscribe to us anywhere you would normally get your podcasts from. We're the bookworms. And we'll be seeing you soon.